I think we should make one thing clear there, which is that looking at this issue of conflicts between copyright and free speech, you can do this, the analysis of how copyright impacts on free speech, but it's not going to lead you to one single ideal model of copyright, or for that matter, to the abolition of copyright. It's more like an envelope, uh, or a floor, or a ceiling. If you puncture the envelope, then the right of free speech can be triggered and used as a, as a corrective. But when, within that envelope, many, many different models of copyright, or possibly even no copyright, uh, can exist. So appealing to the fundamental right of free speech, while it's very important and powerful, is not going to resolve every disagreement about what copyright should look like. What we're looking at today is, if you like, the outer limits. What I'm going to do during this talk is to firstly just look at freedom expression as, as law, how that actually forms part of our law, then look at how copyright and freedom of expression um, interact generally, and then look at 10 particular intersections that I've identified between copyright uh, and freedom of expression, and picking up on those in a few places where it has particular relevance to uh, digital and online. So firstly, um, we're all familiar with free speech as an ideal. Lots of... Um, inspiring things have been said over the years about, uh, about free speech. But fine as these are, you can't go to a court and enforce them. And what we need to, to look at if we're going to use free speech as a corrective to uh, copyright when it, um, if and when it becomes excessive is to have something which we can turn to in the courts. And so we need things like constitutions, we need legal instruments, and we have, for instance, the Bill of Rights, the US Bill of Rights, which is a constitutional document, part of the uh, of US law. Oh, there we go. Uh, we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which, strictly speaking, is not a legal instrument, but is very influential. A lot of people call it soft law. Uh, we have the 1950 European Convention on Human Rights, which has a guarantee of freedom of speech within it. We have the UK Human Rights Act, and we have the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, which is part of European, uh, European law. What have they said about free speech? Well, the earliest one is the US Bill of Rights. They knew how to draft in those days, 14 words, um, very clear and to the point, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, and squarely aimed at um, freedom of speech, enemy number one, uh, the state, and uh, a very robust and, um, and long-lasting protection for freedom of speech. Over the years, these things have got longer. This is um, Article 19 of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, this is the article from which Gabrielle's organization takes its name. Uh, it introduces some interesting or some, some useful concepts, uh, the mutuality, the ability to uh, receive and impart information, uh, the cross-border aspect. And in fact, if you were drafting something to protect speech on the internet, uh, I think you'd be hard put even now to draft anything better than this with its, um, with its stress on through any media and regardless of frontiers. What this has lost, and opinions differ on whether that's a good thing or not, is the specific focus on the role of the state in abridging freedom of expression. We then go to uh, the European Convention on Human Rights, 1950. Uh, this has got longer. Um, it is enforceable um, in European Court of Human Rights. It's part of EU law, uh, and you can enforce it also in uh, the courts in the Strand, just down the road. And uh, this, while sort of derived from the uh, 1948 uh, uh, Universal Declaration, um, has uh, many, many qualifications uh, in the second part, uh, 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 derogating and qualifying the um, 
the right of freedom of expression guaranteed by this. Uh, these are two posters that the Council of Europe, who are responsible for the Convention, um, did a few years ago, uh, the French version and the English version. And um, it's quite interesting, in a very English way, the English version, one, stresses the right to speak responsibly. And one might think that a, a guarantee of free speech, which only protects the right to speak responsibly, um, doesn't protect very much at all. And in fact, I'm going to do something very irresponsible and um, <laughs> scribble that out. And that is what the French version says. Um, I'm in quite good company, actually, because Lord Justice Hoffman, one of our um, now retired but very senior judges, said this a few years ago, um, that a freedom which is restricted to what the judges think is responsible or in the public interest is no freedom. And the freedom means the right to say things which right-thinking people regard as dangerous or irresponsible. A very ringing declaration of what um, freedom of speech uh, should mean. Uh, then we have the EU uh, Charter of Rights and Liberties, um, which is in much the same terms as the European Convention. And these have teeth. They are legal instruments you can use them in the courts. Within Europe, if uh, one is trying to invoke something like freedom of expression um, in order to influence how the courts look at copyright, uh, you have to go through these various steps. I'm not going to go through all of them, but what I am going to concentrate on, there we go, uh, in the ten, my ten examples of intersection is the engagement. Yeah. Do they meet? Do they intersect? How do they intersect? Once you've found that they intersect, then you have to go through all these steps of balancing it with other rights and interests in order to decide whether the right has actually been violated. But the first step, and the most important step, really, is to say, is this right actually engaged? Uh, does copyright, for instance, engage freedom of expression at all? And that isn't um, a given. Back in 1971, this was the US Supreme Court, actually didn't, was rejected the idea that there was any engagement at all, that, that copyright had anything to do with free speech. It said that copyright protects only the form of expression, not the ideas, and therefore because you were always free to uh, express things in different ways, it had no effect on free speech at all. Uh, 15 years, well, nearly 15 years later, uh, the Supreme Court moved its position a bit and implicitly accepted that copyright did engage freedom of speech, but that under US law, uh, the First Amendment uh, was accommodated within particular features uh, internally within copyright law, such as the difference, the idea expression and dichotomy, that copyright ex uh, protects the expression and not ideas, and fair use, which is a very flexible uh, US uh, 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 provision in their Copyright Act, which allows um, the courts to develop uh, uh, the, 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 the notion of what is fair use and therefore not an infringement um, in, 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 in the light of new technologies and new businesses and so on. So that <coughs> enabled the US courts to say, well, the First Amendment does matter, but it's all in com accommodated internally. No matter of, uh, Contrast, in Europe, we don't have fair use. We don't have this flexible uh, exception. We have a whole series of quite restricted, specific exceptions from copyright, um, which means that the courts in Europe are perhaps driven more to looking externally to copyright to the fundamental right of freedom of expression in order to act as a corrective. And we'll see uh, that they have done this from time to time. And this is uh, in the year 2000. This is... Uh, the English Court of Appeal, uh, again taking the view that copyright has nothing to do with freedom of expression at all. It doesn't lie on the same continuum as, nor is it the antithesis of freedom of expression. Eighteen months later, the Court of Appeal said the opposite, turned around and said actually copyright is antithet antithetical to freedom of expression and explained why. So in the space of 18 months, um, our courts completely reversed their view of the relationship between copyright and free speech. Most importantly, probably, 
um, in what I regard as the seminal case of Sabam and Scarlet, which was a uh, ISP filtering case had by the uh, Court of Justice in Europe, uh, they, said, they said this, that there is nothing whatsoever to suggest that intellectual property, and that includes copyright, is inviolable, is inviolable and must for that reason be absolutely protected. It must be balanced against the protection of other fundamental rights. And this was said by Europe's highest court, uh, the, 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 the um, Court of Justice, uh, and I think is, um, is, is a very, very significant statement. And following that, this year, we had the uh, European Court of Human Rights, a different body entirely, uh, in the case called Donald Ashby, uh, effectively saying the same thing, that copyright cases do engage freedom of expression and that you have to look at the balancing um, of copyright, freedom of expression, and other fundamental rights when, uh, when, when, when looking at, uh, at these cases. <coughs> Excuse me. So we've established the principle that copyright can engage free speech, and what I'm going to do now is run through my 10 examples of the, if you like, what I call the, the axes of intersection. And with each of these, basically the further out towards the edge you get, the more likely it is, um, the, 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 sorry, the, 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 um, the more... Uh, the, more, the greater the interference with the fundamental rights and uh, the more likely you are to end up finding that there is a disproportionate interference. Uh, these don't necessarily all act in isolation. Uh, the fact that um, it, it, it may be a combination of these that can produce a finding um, of, uh, of, of disproportionate interference and these are most likely to come up in specific Factual case situations where a judge, said, where the court says, "Well, in this case, it is disproportionate." Much more difficult to strike down a, 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 an entire rule of copyright on the basis of that it, to, to, to argue that that is per se um, a violation. <coughs> and these uh, divide into um, three categories. Really, the first ones are about the scope of copyright, its shape. Uh, the second about you know, who copyright bites on, uh, who infringes and by doing what, and lastly, uh, remedies. If you infringe, what remedies there may be. And the first intersection is expression and ideas. I've mentioned quickly already, I've mentioned already this expression idea dichotomy that's written into various treaties and copyright law. Um, and uh, as you can see there, and how it relates to freedom of expression, obviously, is that if you go too far towards uh, protecting ideas rather than uh, the, the mere expression, then you're going to be uh, having a chilling effect on the ability to exchange ideas, particularly given that uh, there is really nothing new under the sun, that every idea owes something to previous ideas. And that's recognised specifically in the US Supreme Court case of Eldred Nashcroft, uh, in which it says that this is one of the First Amendment accommodations within copyright law. <coughs> Next one I want to look at is briefly is expression and opinion. Obviously, the right to express opinions, particularly political opinions, are um, they rank highly in the hierarchy of protected speech in, um, in, in uh, human rights jurisprudence, and there is very significant potential for copyright to, to interfere, because how can you criticise something, for instance, without quoting from it? Uh, and so it has, uh, there is, uh, and for this reason, uh, all copyright laws make exceptions of some sort for, except for, for opinion. There's fair use, the flexible one in the USA, and there are various more limited ones <coughs> uh, in, in Europe. In the EU, because we don't, specifically because we don't have the flexible US fair use, uh, the specific copyright exceptions in the legislation around Europe are not always enough. And we have, this is one area where we have seen courts resorting to 
the fundamental right of free speech to say, um, notwithstanding that there isn't an exception for this specifically written into the, the copyright law, we will still find that this is not an infringement because if we were to find it's an infringement, it is a disproportionate interference with freedom of speech. <coughs> In the UK, we had the Paddy Ashdown case with the Daily Telegraph. It was, on its facts, unsuccessful, but the English court uh, importantly recognised that there could be cases where... Um, where, where you could run a, a defense of public interest based on uh, disproportionate interference with freedom of expression. There are three cases, uh, these three cases around Europe, where uh, this was done successfully. Uh, a German case in a, a, a play which was commenting on Bertolt Brecht's politics in the 1950s, and as part of that play, it, uh, I think, used four pages from Brecht's plays, which was way outside anything permitted by the uh, specific copyright exceptions. It went up to the German Constitutional Court and said, and they said, well, never mind that it isn't covered by these exceptions. This was necessary and legitimate um, in order for the playwright to be able to comment on uh, and give opinions on, uh, on Brecht, and therefore this was legitimate, even though on the letter of the copyright law it, was an, it would have been an infringement. <coughs> Uh, it's happened in Austria. Um, someone was criticised in a series of newspaper articles, reproduced those articles on his website in order, as part of, uh, in order to demonstrate that he was being criticised and to complain about it, and that was held to be a legitimate thing to do, even though he didn't have permission to reproduce those articles and they weren't within the statutory quotation right. And the Scientology case in, in the Netherlands, where secret... Um, or confidential Church of Scientology documents were uh, published on a website. Uh, Scientologists sued and for, for copyright infringement, and the court said, no, this is legitimate uh, public ex uh, uh, exercise of the freedom of expression, and, uh, and therefore this, uh, we're, we're not going to hold this to be <coughs> an infringement. My favourite one of these is this one. Nadia Plesner, um, the Darfurnica and Simple Living case. Uh, the problem was this. This is uh, Nadia Plesner's uh, painting, Darfurnica. Um, does anyone here, if anyone knows the answer to this, don't, um, don't say. Does, can anyone here tell, uh, have a guess at what the problem was with this painting? Anyone speak? Speak up. Sorry. Uh, might have been, but no. Might have been, but no. The handbag. Well done. It's the handbag. <coughs> this this is a Louis Vuitton handbag. Uh, Louis Vuitton have a community register design uh, protecting the design of this handbag, and they sued for infringement of the registered design. Um, as you can probably tell, this, is, this painting is a political, well, it's a political statement contrasting Western consumerism with the situation in Darfur. <coughs> so it had a clear political aspect to it. They sued, they got an injunction, um, and it went to appeal. And on appeal, they made clear they weren't actually suing about the painting, but what they were, or the exhibition, or the sale of the painting, what they were suing on was various T-shirts, posters that were on sale uh, at, the, um, at the exhibition at which the painting was exhibited um, and also uh, on, on the website. And on the, again, on the letter of Dutch copyright law, there's absolutely no exception whatsoever. Sorry, copyright law, it's um, uh, community registered design, but you know, intellectual property nonetheless. Um, there's no, there was nothing in the letter of the law to say that this was... Um, uh, that this was okay, and on the face of it, it was a pretty clear <coughs> infringement. But the Hague District Court looked at outside that legislation and said, well, there is this fundamental right to freedom of expression, and this is a statement of artistic opinion, and her interest to be able to express that opinion through this work should outweigh the interest of Louis Vuitton in the peaceful enjoyment of its possession, which is the exclusive rights and the use of the design, and 
The illustration is a lawful statement of her artistic opinion, and they quashed the, the order. So complete defense. And I think that, it, I, mean, I say it's my favorite partly because the picture is fun, uh, but also because it is a very, very clear example of a court having recourse to external fundamental rights to override the letter of intellectual property legislation. Next one is my next um, the axis is originality and facts. Again, uh, the problem here is that if you have a too low an originality threshold, if it protects originality at too low a level, then that can impact the ability to re-communicate facts that are uh, communicated through a copyright work. And the level of originality um, is, has to be set at a level that doesn't unduly, um, that doesn't unduly impact on that. And uh, again, the US Supreme Court has said that US copyright law um, internally has that balance right. <coughs> we have to probably think here not just about copyright, which is ev what everyone thinks of. There are other rights, such as database right, which we have in Europe, um, which probably impacts more on the ability to recommunicate facts than, than, than copyright. And again, this is um, uh, because of this potential, there are um, uh, uh, exceptions from copyright written in uh, to, 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 for instance, for reporting current events. Again, occasionally the exceptions are not good enough. There was a French case here uh, in which a newspaper uh, did a photo montage of the world, uh, to do with the World Cup, the Football World Cup, and had a picture of the trophy, the World Cup trophy, as part of that photo montage. And they were sued for uh, infringement of copyright. And the, the French court, the Court de Cassation, their highest court, said, no, this, this, even though under the letter of the law this is an infringement, this is um, inseparable, as they put it, from the act of informing the public about the course of this news event, and therefore it would be an infringement of the fundamental right of freedom of expression to, uh, to hold that this was an infringement. My next axis is uh, dissemination and reference. Um, Copyright has always wanted to uh, prevent the dissemination of infringing copies, but what about referring to the existence or location of infringing copies? That starts to engage the, um, the right of freedom of expression uh, because one is trying to prevent then access to information and knowledge. And one of the examples in the online world which, uh, uh, which engages this is, of course, web linking. <coughs> And uh, Tim Berners-Lee here has uh, come out, came out very strongly in the early, very early in the uh, days of the web um, to say that the right to make, his view was the right to make reference to something was inherent in the First Amendment uh, uh, right. Um, on the web to make reference without making a link is possible but ineffective, like speaking but with a paper bag over your head. Uh, though that argument was... Uh, that, that uh, didn't actually succeed in a case um, in America about the, uh, the DEX uh, decryption uh, software and creating a link to that. Um, and the, the court sort of drew a distinction between the functionality of the link and the, the expressive aspect of the link. But um, at any rate, the uh, web linking engages this. And I'll have a bit more to say about web linking in a minute. We then have the vexed uh, question of copyright term. Um, the most obvious way in which long copyright terms start to engage freedom of expression is with orphan works. Um, so if you have build up a, uh, a, 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 um, a category of orphan works which uh, can't be reproduced because people can't find the owners uh, through, because you know, they're long, long gone, then that um, is going to uh, engage the um, uh, freedom of expression in terms of the uh, ability to access and find and find works. Uh, the First Amendment examples, it has to be said, were uh, very unsuccessful in the, the two American cases which have, have tried to, to challenge increases in, in copyright 
term. We then look at uh, suppliers and users. This is all to do with who infringes, and it's one of the areas in which digital copyright has most changed um, uh, uh, the, 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 um, how copyright works. Before digital, and probably more accurately before electronic, if one thinks about the cassette tapes in the, in the 1970s, copyright bit on plagiarists, people who created works and overborrowed from other people's works, on manufacturers and distributors. And if you're at the head of the chain, if you're the person who copied or the person who was manufacturing the copies, uh, then you were strictly liable um, for, the, for the infringement, uh, regardless of whether you knew that what you were doing was infringing or not. If you were a middleman somewhere down, down the chain dealing in these copies, then you were only liable if you knew that they were infringing. <laughs> and if you were the user, at the consumer end, if you were a purchaser, if you borrowed an infringing copy, if you were merely reading a book, if you were viewing something, then you didn't infringe at all. Copyright was nothing to do with you. And as a result of the accidental result of the digital revolution, uh, copyright has extended its reach to users and is one of the reasons why organisations like org, like digital rights organisations, um, have grown up around the world is because of this uh, extent of the reach of copyright into the world of users. <coughs> the um, freedom of expression engagement is particularly in the chilling effect of imposing liability on users because if you, particularly if you have strict liability, you're not in a position to know whether what you're about to access is infringing or not and therefore it will chill, uh, may deter you from accessing legitimate non-infringing content. And there is a case pending to the European Court of Justice in which I suspect those arguments are going to be ventilated. We then have the acts that are restricted by copyright. We all know that copying, obviously, is restricted by copyright, but also, more recently, we have communication to the public, making available to the public that quite obviously engages freedom of expression by the very nature of the fact that it's to do with communication. And we have lots of cases going on to do with web linking, um, two cases which are going to the European Court of Justice at the moment about whether um, links to, uh, to, to, for instance, infringing material uh, uh, um, infringe the communication to the public right and I would absolutely expect the Court of Justice to be looking at the, um, at the, 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 the impact on uh, the proportionality and freedom of expression arguments when they come to, uh, to look at those. We then have remedies and this is uh, obviously a serious one. There are all sorts of different remedies for copyright infringement and they can engage freedom of expression in different ways, criminal or civil, if it's, if it's criminal, whether it's fines, imprisonment uh, for civil, whether it's just damages, whether there are injunctions, which if you breach you can then go to prison, all these will result in different degrees of interference with, um, with, with, the, with, with, with uh, freedom of expression and it can get quite complicated uh, this is a very quick and probably very oversimplified chart as I've done of the situation in the UK comparing you know, the potential liability for, for downloading uh, compared with browsing or viewing a stream and compared with uploading and you get a very um, a sort of patchwork of civil versus criminal liability uh, for, or in some cases, no liability at all, depending on the exact nature of the activity that's being done. And obviously, one would argue that, for instance, merely browsing or viewing um, is, uh, is that a sanction for that is far more disproportionate than, for instance, a sanction for uploading something to, um, to the whole of the web. And lastly, the focus of the remedies. Um, targeted versus scattergun remedies that are focused very clearly on the actual infringing activity or the infringing material are going to be more proportionate than 
remedies that have the potential to impact on non-infringing legitimate material. And uh, this is particularly relevant to things like filtering injunctions and website blocking injunctions, of which obviously we're seeing more of. And the Saban Scarlet case was to do with a filtering injunction against an intermediary, and the CJAU said that uh, because of the potential impact on legitimate uh, content, uh, the, the injunction that was being sought was disproportionate and would interfere with the free speech rights of, of users. <coughs> Again, a very seminal case. So, to finish up, um, answering the question that I asked to begin with, um, I'd say that before 2000, there was no contest at all. It really wasn't accepted that copyright and free speech in the courts had anything, anything to do with each other. In the 10 years after 2000, it began to be accepted that there was an engagement and you start to see um, some national courts around Europe occasionally um, uh, 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 giving a win to free speech um, in opposition to copyright or occasionally other rights. And then from 2010 onwards, we have this recognition at, uh, if you like, pan-European highest court level that uh, copyright always has to be balanced with other fundamental rights, which puts in place the potential for, um, for, for using this as a tool uh, more so in the future. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, so my name is Gabrielle Guillemin, and I work at Article 19. Article 19 is an international free speech organization. And so um, what I'm going to talk to you today is about uh, the right to share principles. And there's a number of things I'd like to do uh, about this, is explain, first of all, um, why we started our endeavor and came up with, with these principles. Then I'd like to introduce a couple of them. Um, and then I'll explain the types of challenges that we're facing and where we think that these principles might be useful. Um, just to explain in a little more detail what Article 19 does. As I said, we're an international free speech organization. We use uh, international standards on freedom of expression, international human rights law, to formulate um, international principles and recommendations on various policy areas. We've done a lot of work around hate speech, around broadcasting, and one of our signature types of documents is international standards series. And if you like, for the right to share principles uh, that I'm gonna present today are just the, the latest one in the series. We've done similar work around freedom of expression and national security. They're called the Johannesburg Principles, and around um, freedom of expression and equality, they're called the Camden Principles. And these principles over the years have been used by the courts internationally. Um, the Johannesburg Principles were used by, by the House of Lords, um, and the Camden Principles have been used in the context of something called the Rabat Action Plan. So the hope is that uh, these principles will... Um, be uh, equally successful and will be taken into account by courts and policymakers in the area of freedom of expression and copyright. But just to get back to why we started doing this, um, Graham mentioned that um, traditionally um, it's been thought that copyright had internal mechanisms to deal with free speech concerns, and in some ways for me this is something that almost sounds strange because having worked at, at the European Court of Human Rights, um, I'm very used to conflict of rights. So it's not just uh, freer expression and copyright, but it's actually freer expression and privacy, for example, which is a common one, or freer expression and freedom of religion. So for me it would have been quite obvious to, to think about the conflict between freer expression and copyright. On the other hand, looking at the case law uh, of the European Court, uh, it's fair to say that there's very little uh, case law and we're just seeing uh, it beginning to happen and more cases coming through. And I think that also illustrates the fact that um, a lot of these cases just don't go up to the courts, partly because nowadays with the internet, a lot more internet users may be affected, but it may not always be possible for all to go through the 
rather costly process of going, going through the courts. In any event, Article 19, as a free speech organization, we thought that in the debate on copyright and piracy in particular, the, the free speech voice and human rights advocates was missing. And um, looking generally, it just seemed that on, on balance, the balance between freedom of expression and copyright, freedom of expression was pretty much losing and perhaps there was not enough um, of a um, proper presentation of the areas in which freedom of expression and copyright intersect and where um, uh, th there were points where copyright might be going too far. So this is why we set out to get various international experts around the world to, to try and, and come up with these principles. So really, uh, as Graham said, it's some kind of envelope, looking at the areas where there is this intersection and where we think that this copyright might be uh, going too far. We also um, try to promote some positive measures in some sections of the principles. Just to be clear, though, um, what the principles do not do is to try and, and propose uh, alternative business, business models. So even though when looking at copyright in Paris in particular, it's very much about the economic interest and you know, what we thought was that people should also look at fundamental rights. We do not try to, to propose like a, a magic solution. So, and rightly uh, in our view, since we're not economic experts, we're not uh, business managers, so we leave it to others more qualified to do so. Uh, at the same time, the principles do not seek to, to condone uh, illegal file sharing. And this is something that is apparent if you go through the various sections of the principles and um, in particular looking at principle 11, for example, on civil liability and even looking at principle 2, which talks about copyright. So we very much recognize copyright as being a human right, which, trust me, even uh, to recognize that has been, has led to various interesting philosophical discussions. But on balance, looking at the international human rights instrument that, instruments that are existing, things like the EU Charter on Fundamental Rights, um, we uh, thought it important to, to have it up there and recognized as a human right. And um, as you see from like the previous um, the previous slide is like these principles. There's 15 of them divided into six sections. And by the way, uh, if you want to have a look at them in more detail, there should still be a couple of copies in the area where the st where the stalls are. So what I'm going to do now, briefly, is to highlight some of those principles. I'll be very happy to discuss others in the Q&A session afterwards. So the first of those principles is fair dealing and derivative works. And this is something which for us has become very important for freedom of expression because now on the internet people have very much the ability to create a lot more easily than before since they can pretty much you know, publish and communicate the material themselves. And so you, you see a lot of these things, for example, on YouTube and, and this thing of rip, mix, smash and burn. And so um, in principle six, we, we, we thought we sought to emphasize the fact that the limitations and exceptions that Graham was telling you about should be interpreted broadly so as to give you know, greater protection to the right to freedom of expression. And this is because traditionally, so far as copyright is concerned, that's where freedom of expression has been protected. But we seek to re-emphasize the fact that freedom of expression, when looking at those, needs enhanced protection. So for example, if you look at the UK High Court in this country in 2011, Lady Gaga won an injunction to remove a Lady Goo Goo song from the Monchi Monsters channel on YouTube. And this was a, a special dance. It was very successful with children, but because there was a song which sounded a little bit like the paparazzi song um, by Lady Gaga, the the uh, the the song was eventually removed from from YouTube, and that's the sort of thing where you've got here some form of parody, which um, lost out against copyright. 
Another interesting thing is that when you look in the world of copyright, some copyright experts also have, have thought that you know, there are certain areas in which copyright might be going to find might be worth trying to um, inter interpret these exceptions broadly. And a, a group of copyright experts came up with this declaration on a balanced interpretation of the three-step three step test in copyright law. And um, again, uh, in looking at the three-step test, they said that fundamental rights should be given special consideration when, when applying it. So um, it's, just, it's not just um, a, a question of trying to, to do minimum harm to, to authors. It, it's also about taking into account the wider public interests. So the next principle, which in some way could be considered to be fairly uncontroversial, is the one about disconnection from access to the internet. Um, this, uh, in the principle, principle A, we think it's a disproportionate restriction on free expression. And we didn't just you know, come up with it. This is something that we sort of establish in international standards on free expression so, and best practices. So, for example, here, um, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression looked at the issue, like the various issues that came up between freedom of expression and the internet, and one of those was disconnection. And he clearly said that cutting off users from internet access, um, including on grounds of copyright, was a disproportionate um, violation of uh, freedom of expression. At the same time, even if you look outside of, of copyright, um, you have the UK Court of Appeal uh, who's found that the, a blanket ban on computer use or internet access are impermissible. And this is, the fact about disconnections is the recognition that nowadays internet access is such a, an, a vital part of everyday life. That's not just for, it, it's to look for a job, but it goes much more beyond that. So, it is a clear violation uh, of human rights. And so I think it's interesting because, for example, this UK Court of Appeal case was in, in relation to the right of access, but it was for sex offenders, actually, to, to, to have access to the internet. So that illustrates how the, the, the right of access to the internet in, in this context is important and why disconnection um, is a disproportionate restriction. Next is filtering and blocking of content subject to copyright. Well, you must have read a lot about uh, website filtering and blocking. There, there have been high-profile cases here on blocking access to, to torrent sites. Um, so what we think, generally speaking, is that website blocking is a disproportionate measure, and this is largely based on um, two things. It's basically the risk of over-blocking and you know, the lack of effectiveness of the measure. So... And this is something that we've based on, on two things. First of all, looking at overblocking, this is something that, that was found by Ofcom when looking at the various ways in which material ca can be blocked. And, and uh, in that case, um, it was found that the, the, the available techniques uh, carried a risk of overblocking and were not 100% effective. Uh, and then there's obviously the seminal case that uh, Graham mentioned already of Sabam um, Scarlet and, and Scarlet uh, Extended, where the court said that you know, granting an injunction uh, to block all sorts of material was just you know, n not an option because it's impossible to know in advance whether some material might be legal or not. So, but in recognition of the fact that Sometimes the courts already use website blocking as a device. In the principle, we, we try and look at some minimum standards that we think should be applied when the courts consider how, uh, the, in considering the scope of a blocking order. So that includes, for, for example, you know, bearing in mind it should be as targeted as possible because what you don't want is that the injunction to, to block uh, material that is perfectly legitimate. Something interesting uh, in this context, to give you another example, is that 
in Turkey, recently, there was the, the, the Scribd website was entirely blocked just because of one uh, copyright claim. I was at a talk where a, a, a Turkish expert on internet uh, was explaining, uh, to, telling us about this case. And more recently, there was also um, an Australian case where in order to, to, to block some sites which were supposedly defrauding, um, it was to counter fraud, they, they ended up uh, blocking access to over 200,000 sites, which were innocuous. So this is blocking. The next one I want to tell you about briefly is... Um, intermediary liability and content removal. I don't know if you're familiar with notice and takedown. So for example, you have something up and there is a, a request uh, by a copyright holder. They send the request to the intermediary and um, then you have various types, like different processes in order for the material to be removed. Um, well, in relation, to, in relation to that, I mean, generally speaking, we think there are a, a number of problems with those notice and takedown procedures, which is fair to say are not always actually um, spelt out in legislation. For example, in Europe, they're very much the result of broader provisions. Um, but in any event, um, the, when looking at these types of procedures, in the principles, we, we try and set out some minimum requirements of due process that you know, we think should be in there so, so as to make those, those procedures um, more compatible with human rights standards. Because very often you, you have a situation where the person who had the material up is not informed that there's been a notice um, so, and there's no right of count on notice, either it's not spelled out or it's not happening in practice. Um, so the, the, we list some of those requirements and these are the, those that you can see here. Um, possibilities of remedies, um, also having a remedy when there's abusive or neg negligent copyright notices. Um, so these are the types of, uh, of measures we're looking at. We also uh, recommend looking at alternative mechanisms such as notice and notice procedures, which is something you find in, in Canada. Uh, another one of the principles that was mentioned in the previous slide is in relation to no monitoring, but that goes back to um, um, the Sabam case and uh, also the Article 19 of the e-commerce directive, which is set out here. Now, looking ahead, um, so why do, do we think these principles can be useful? Um, uh, copyright is not just something that's <coughs> being dealt with by parliaments. Um, sometimes it's more effective for various groups to, to try and seek to, for international trade agreements to be adopted with copyright provisions. Uh, you must have heard about uh, ACTA, so that led to a uh, huge amount of demonstrations uh, in Europe, um, but uh, ACTA was not uh, adopted in, in the EU. The European Parliament refused to, to sign it, but now we're looking at other international trade agreements where some of the provisions that we thought um, were dangerous for fundamental rights uh, may be coming back uh, in the transatlantic free trade area um, agreement or Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Another one is in the Pacific region, and so we're looking at similar things. And the problem that we have here, from the perspective of fundamental rights, is that these international international trade agreements concern fundamental rights, but yet there's no real de there's no democratic process involved. Uh, people are kept in the dark. The negotiation takes place in secret. So, in the principles, actually, we we seek to to push for greater transparency, and we have a principle about that, which is principle uh, 14 and 15. And finally, looking at how things happen abroad, domestic legislation, 
But we see at the Canada team, we have offices in various parts of the world, and our colleagues in the Brazil office are finding that the digital rights framework that uh, they're supporting is having a hard time going through because the, the copyright lobby is, is pushing for, for measures, notice and take down procedures, and so they're in a deadlock where um, the rights of um, internet users and people in general are having a hard time you know, against uh, other lobbies. So that concludes um, my presentation about the principles, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions you may have, and as I said, further copies uh, outside. Thank you very much.